Hey guys, Will Terry here, and this video is going to be called How to Break Into Children's Book Illustration. And uh, so I'm going to get going on that topic, but before I do, I just, and a lot of times before I get going, I like to just kind of talk about things that I've been thinking about. And so I have the topic, but I also, I feel like we have this relationship and I got to let you know things. And so one, one thing that I wanted to let you know is that's kind of been on my mind because a lot of people, I don't know, it's the, you know, people ask me questions and, and they'll say things like, you know, you need to up the quality of your video or you need to do this, that, or the other, or, um, and it's usually like a critique on the production quality of my videos. The production quality of these videos isn't amazing. And I realized that, um, but there's a reason for that. And so I thought I would give you that at the beginning of this video. And that is the, the, the whole reason that this YouTube channel started. I didn't wake up one day and go, you know, I'm going to start a YouTube channel and give people advice. What, what really happened was, um, uh, just from every day, you know, just being an illustrator. Um, and this was, I guess this goes back like four or five years, um, and I would just get questions from time to time and I would sit there and bang out answers on, on the keyboard. And the more, it seemed like the more questions I answered, the more questions I would get. And I started putting them in FAQs. And sometimes like when people um, are doing book reports for their college class or whatever, they'll all still send out those FAQs cause they're pretty detailed and, and uh, you know, they answer a lot of questions that, that people have. But um, I started to, out of selfishness, basically, out of wanting to preserve my own time. I started to, I started this YouTube channel um, to basically put answers down on video because it was quicker just to either show, show something on the screen or just answer a question just from rambling, you know. And one of the things, one of the, one of the comments I often get is your videos are too long. You ramble on, you know, you're not cutting and, and editing and stuff like that. And you, you know, a half an hour is way too long and stuff like that. I get it. If you're one of those people that's into like five minutes, I'm trying to figure out how to break in like, like for this video, how to break in a children's book illustration. It's just not me. I, I hate the, the long video. I know I've talked about that before or the short videos, um, they usually don't give enough nuance to a conversation like that, number one. Um, and you usually go away feeling like you didn't really get enough. That's how I feel when I when I watch. So anyway, it, long story short, this really came about so that I could email people a link to a video. So I'd get a question, I'd answer it, and then I'd send the person a link. And I figured, hey, this will also help other people. Instead of me just typing, spending, you know, 10 or 20 minutes typing out an answer and then sending it to somebody and then it's just a communication between two people put it in on video form and then it could help more people and then it just kind of blossomed um to where a lot of people benefited from it just like i benefit from other people's channels and stuff um other people that talk about art and business the business side of art and stuff like that um and so anyway I, is what's funny is I was sitting in the other room and no one was blowing off fireworks. This is like the, this is July 6th, a few days after the 4th of July. As soon as I sit down, I start hearing fireworks going off. Not that that should really bother us, right? We're going to continue to have this conversation anyway. Okay. And as usual, um, I hope you're drawing or doing something useful instead of just watching me um, uh, because I'm just going to ramble on this subject. But I got this question, so to get back on topic here, I got this this great question from a guy named Bert um, just a few days ago. And I I apologize. I have a list of questions that I keep. I have a bunch that I plan on answering. Sometimes I move them up in the order. And so this one jumped the line just because I felt like I haven't talked about this in a while. Um, and, 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 and I feel like this will actually help a lot of people who have been asking this question on, um, you know, like how to break into the business. So he says, I've been following you and listening to your advice for some time now. I think it's wonderful to share so much and you're honest about it. Thank you. Um, honesty is the, 
is the new currency for the internet, right? Um, so, you know, people can see right through your BS, right? So it's, I, it's refreshing to me. I, I spend a lot of time on YouTube simply for, because I feel like I can follow people that are giving me good information. Um, I am an experienced artist who's written his first children's book. My question to you, since I'm a beginner with books, is should I hire an editor to review my work? If so, where should I look? Find a decent person for this and not one of the fakes that advertise all over the net. Great. That's That was one of the reasons why I wanted to answer this is for that line right there. Not find one of the fakes that advertise all over the net. I appreciate your time as I can imagine how busy you must be by the way you have created some, oh, thank you, some lovely work. Okay, so uh, let's dive into this. And I have, if you're gonna write this down, there's gonna be four basic uh, areas with, with subcategories, okay? Four basic pieces of advice on how to break into children's books. Um, and f first, let me just say that hire you could there are people that you can hire that are really good the problem i see and you know like usual sometimes we get into sometimes the the gems of making videos is found in the comments because other people have insights and i usually go through for the first week or two and just kind of look at the comments and see um what's going on there and then from time to time thereafter but um, feel free, free to disagree, but I kind of feel like even if you have a good editor, if you were able to find a really reputable one who's been in the business, and I would say just offhand, if the editor hasn't really worked in children's books, then they're probably not reputable, at least for giving you advice for, ch for children's books. And let me just also say this. I'm going to be giving advice to working with um, medium to big publishers in the U S and even abroad in, in Europe and other places like that. Um, the, the, the big show, right? So I'm not talking about, you know, working with, with a, an individual at home. Not that that's not valid. I'm not talking about working with the tiny presses and stuff like that. Those are great jobs too. But I think that the, the reason I'm going to, I'm gearing towards the big is because that's usually the goal for most people. So I want people to be shooting, um, for that direction. Cause I think that's what they're asking, you know, breaking into children's books. I don't think they're saying, um, I don't think that the, the question is how do I break into the, the worst clients, the tiniest clients. Um, so I kind of feel like if an editor is, has worked in for the big publishers, but they're selling their services online then they're then why did they get fired you know what i mean like why are they spending time it doesn't make sense to me and i don't know any editors that really do that a lot except for a few people like um like i know um uh, giuseppe castellano does and he is a, he's a great editor or um art director and but he um gives great advice on twitter and he does portfolio reviews and teaches and stuff like that um that's different and the reason that's different is because he's kind of created a side thing publicly um along with his job and it's it's i feel like in in a lot of ways he's he's building his twitter that way um which i think is really smart um and so he's an exception to that rule um and i'll put a link let's see I'm going to make myself a note. Okay, finished making myself a note. Um, so I probably, I'm going to basically advise you in general not to hire someone for this information. I don't feel like you're going to get really good industry information by hiring someone. I don't feel like that's the way it's done. Um, not that you couldn't, not that there aren't exceptions, but just in general. Um, so let's dive in. Okay, so number one, you got to have the art that they want, which sounds really simple, but there's a lot to it, right? If you have what they want, they're going to hire you. This isn't a popularity contest. It's not a, it's not who's got the best looks. Thank goodness. Um, it's not about, um, you know, if you have a lot of money, um, it's not who, you know, it's what you can do. 
It's if you have what they want. So you can have, and, and I've seen this before. I'm just going to clean my glasses while we're friends here, right? I just feel like my glasses are a little cloudy. Um, you've got to, you've, but you've got to somehow get into the mind of the art director and editor. And that's really who you want to talk to. So number one, you got to find the, the art directors and editors. And I'll talk, talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so the first thing that I would suggest under that number one is you've got to consume a lot of books. You've got to be at the library or at the bookstore. You've got to be checking out books, buying books, reading books, looking at and seeing a pattern of what what they're hiring. And I I know that art styles are all over the place when you go to the children's bookstore. We tend to look at the books that that we like when we go, at least that's how I am, and we tend to avoid the books that we that don't really appeal to us visually. My suggestion is get to know the whole market. So sample lots of different styles and try to figure out what people are doing. It's interesting that what we really want, I think the beginner illustrator, because I was like this, um, we want them to like what we do. We don't want to conform to what they want. But the reality is, a lot of times, they don't like what we're already doing. It doesn't really fit into their market. Um, it doesn't fit into what they're they're trying to do and say. And so I think the smart illustrator understands that they can do a lot of different things. They're not... They don't have to just do one style. They can adapt and they can they can um, they can fall in love with doing different modifications to their own work. Um, and you'll find uh, you'll look and see who's getting published or what illustrators are getting work. And to me, it seems like it's the ones I wouldn't say necessarily that they're chameleons, but they're very adaptable. And that's something that is is really hard to teach. It's really hard to explain, but I think what you do is you you teach yourself by consuming a lot of art and seeing what they're publishing. Like for instance, I know I've talked about this before. A lot of editors really like a lot of white space art directors. They they like a lot of vignettes and silhouetted um, characters, and it's just a it's just a reality that it, that children's book art is quite different than in general than you know doing work for a gallery or doing you know personal illustration pieces um not that there's not exceptions to that because there are but um but that's a huge that's a huge market and that's one area where you could be more adaptable um let's see and i switched this one around um so then another thing under that first one is um to develop your own skills, which is obvious, but the, it's surprising to me how many people want to just just decide. Well, I'm going to go into children's illustration, but they don't learn um, a lot of the fundamentals. They don't go. They either didn't go to school, or if they did go to school, maybe they went to an art program that that didn't really teach children's book illustration. Um, maybe they didn't take any illustration classes at all, and there are. Lots of illustrators who never took any, who never went to school, and who have done really well, um, or who went to art school. It, there's just all walks of life that, that have found a home in children's books. But the one thing they have in common is they figured out what editors want. Um, and I think it's easier to figure that out if you're exposed to an illustration, um, illustration classes, specifically children's book illustrations, if you can find it. Excuse me. Um, so skills like, you know, when you, when you do a children's book and these are things that art directors are going to look at and in their meetings, in their acquisition meetings, when they pitch names for illustrators and they're looking at potentially your work, you might have been pitched for a meeting or for a book and never have known it. Um, and one of the things that, that they'll say in those meetings is, well, I really like this person's work, but it looks like they have a problem with character consistency or it looks like they have a problem with um with lighting you know lighting inconsistencies or or they've got like really bad color um and i'm just looking at my notes here um 
but you really do need to develop the skills uh you you have to wear so many different hats in children's books it's amazing um what you have to be good at you have to you, it's basically like being the director of a film but you also have to be the lighting guy the props guy the environment guy the costume guy or gal the posing you know posing and acting you've got to be the actor you've got to you've got to get into your character's head and and be able to act and come up with the gestures that are believable it's surprising to me how many people don't do that so they sit at their desk in a very calm static way and they try to draw something that's full of action and they don't figure out the mechanics of it and i'm guilty of that too we all are um but knowing that and knowing what you have to do to get it right is you know part of being smart as an illustrator um, you've got to know about value and focal points and, and, and like I mentioned before, color and all those different things. So you've got to develop those skills. Shameless plug, guess what? We teach that at svslearn.com. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then uh, it's funny because uh, this is like an anecdotal thing that I'll throw in there. But I, it's funny. I've heard stories and I've heard a few people talk about um, that they're going to illustrate books for money while they break into the thing they really want to do, which is sometimes it's gallery work or or sometimes it might be um, animation or whatever it is. But like I, the, the idea that illustrating children's books is easy. Um, and I think that that's, that's an arrogance that some people have, some of us have, um, when we just don't understand about life and about industries and things like that and no and the, no matter what you have to know this that no matter what walk whatever walk of life you go into right no matter what activity you get involved in there are going to be people that have been doing it for decades and they've been dedicating their lives to it and it and it's been their soul their life's work and to think that you can walk in and just say well i'm going to I'm going to do this part time or just, you know, to, to make some extra money so I can really get into the thing I really want to do. Just go and get the thing that you really want to get. Um, because if children's books isn't it for you, you're never going to, you'll never uh, be able to, to do it. I mean, I, I don't know of anybody who's been able to kind of just sort of go pick, you know, one day just decide, oh, I'm going to illustrate children's books and, and just kind of walk right in. It's a really tough thing to get into. Um, and that's simply because there's more of us than them. There's, 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 you know, for every, for every, illustr I don't know what the, st the actual stats are, but let's just say for every hundred illustrators that want to illustrate children's books, one's actually doing it. I don't know if it's that bad or if it's that good. Um, but I mean, you know, it, the, the statistics are really, really bad, not on your side, but they are on your side. If you're the guy who, or the gal who wants to make it your life's work. If you're if you're that committed, um, and I remember uh, when I was doing, uh, I, sh I wish I had gotten this book down, but it was um, um, the Three Little Gators, written by Helen Ketterman, that I did. I illustrated that. Um, gosh, that must have been like seven or eight years ago, something like that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but. You know, I got all the sketches done, and I had a bunch of work at the time. And I it turned out that when I got the approval on all the sketches, I had about 28 days. It was literally 28 days, I still remember, to do about 20 illustrations. And some of the illustrations were e easier than others. Some were really complicated spreads. And so I basically budgeted, and I just figured out my days for 28 days. I did nothing. I did go for like a half an hour walk just to get like, you know, to shake out the month. But I sat, I would get up in the morning. In fact, um, for a week of that, my wife had a conference um, when she was teaching school. She had to go to go for a conference and it just worked out that um, I went with her and I worked in the hotel room um, for about five days of that. But it was the same thing there. And I, and we had um, some friends take our kids because it just gave me even more time to just morning till night do nothing. And I remember thinking, my commitment level is so high and I was so proud of myself. And it was only 28 days. 
Yet I felt like I was just so dedicated because I was working from morning till night. And it was a big project and it was a lot of dedication. But at the same time, there are people who work for a year on a project. And like that, basically every day working really hard, working their guts out for a year. And there's people that have worked for two years and five years and, and even 10 years probably on, on, on different projects where their commitment level was so high that they were just going to, when the, when the project finally hit the shelves, they were just going to blow people away. Um, I think you have to, to find that focus and, and, you know, don't be scared if you don't have that now, that's, that's a skill that you can develop over time simply by demanding more from yourself each time you, you work. Um, but your dedication level has to be off the charts or, you know, breaking in to the business is, is probably not going to be there. And there are, you know, people who are, I would, I wouldn't really call it luck. You might say there's a little bit of a luck factor because they're in the right place at the time with the right style and, and they, they kind of get a book and, you know, it wasn't that hard. Well, a lot of those people worked really hard to get into animation first and then they kind of just stepped right over into children's books because they had this crazy skill level um, and there's a lot of people in in that situation um, who are doing quite well in children's books but they've they've kind of taken that from working being crazy committed to going in a different direction first and then in or like a guy I've talked about before Mo Willems who you know is was a, a highly skilled author who then kind of decided to start illustrating his own books and found a style that that worked for him even though he wasn't a classically trained illustrator um, and then ended up winning Caldecott honors and stuff and so um, and you know makes a it makes a ton of money a grip of money um, with his children's books and so um, yeah you've got to be super motivated okay Okay, so number we're going to move on to number two now, and that's um, you got to market yourself. These are some of these things are going to be obvious, um, but I think that I'm going to give you enough specifics that I'm I'm hoping that this is really helpful because some people have no clue how how would you ever get into children's books, right? Um, so let's assume that you have what they want. So you're sitting in your little cave somewhere. And you've got this this gold. You're just you, you. Your hands are this gold machine. You're spinning gold, but nobody knows that you've got gold in your little cave, right? So you've got to get the word out there. Um, it's basically pretty simple. I will. I'm going to send you another shameless plug. We go into crazy depth in this in our children's book class at svslearn.com with tons of specifics. I'm going to give you some here, but we go even further there. Um, and, and basically there's, there's really kind of, there's a lot of ways to get your work in front of an art director, but there's really a couple really simple ways that are proven and that work over and over and over again. Um, and that, that's basically sending your work in via like a postcard, a direct mail piece. And people will say, really, but we've got the internet today. And why would, why would you ever do that? And the, the, the thing is. A piece of mail still has clout because there, you know, at least here in the U.S., when you send someone a letter, that has to be delivered to them. I mean, like, there's there's a law, I guess, where if you paid for postage, it has to go in their box. Now they might have an intern or a secretary or something going through it, but I still talk to art directors. Postcards work, so you got to send your work in. I could spend an hour just talking about how to develop a mailing list. I'm not going to do that now. Um, we have that all in our class. Um, but there's ways, there's easy ways to get these names of these art directors. Um, one way that you can get it is I'll, sh I'll give a shout out to SCBWI. They have a mailing list that they keep up to date. And if you simply join SCBWI, I'll link that as well. They will give you their mailing list. It comes with it. Okay. So get your work in front of them. The cool thing about a postcard versus something that you put in an envelope is um, they have to see it before they throw it away <laughs> because it's opened. I mean, because it's it's not hidden behind the, a paper shroud, right? So your work is going to get seen by someone. You know, surprisingly, I think a lot of interns are trained on what's good and what's not. A lot of them have been to art school and things like that. So um, 
and it, it is a numbers game, but getting your work out there, um, lots of work. I've gotten, oh, probably hundreds of jobs from postcards over the years. And so I don't send them out anymore because I don't need to um, market as much because I've, you know, gotten to a point where um, I, I can get work without doing that because it's a, it's a pain. Um, and it, there is an expense and while you're doing it, when you're doing your first one, I'll just say this, it's the worst because you're spending time and money on something that you have no guarantee of any return. And most of the things that we do in life, we want a guarantee that something good's going to come from it when we put when we put forth effort. And I'll just say this, if you have that feeling, if you're if you're thinking about doing a postcard, if you start working on a postcard and you just feel like I'm wasting my time, I shouldn't be doing this, that's what everybody feels. Um, now, if you don't have what they want, then it is a waste of time because you're not going to get work from it. How do you know if you have what they want? That's the million dollar question. Um, I will talk about that hopefully a little bit later. <laughs> um, if I can remember, um, how do you know? Uh, I'm going to write this as I go. Um, you know what? That actually fits under number two. So I'm just going to answer that right now. Um, one way that you can find out and know exactly what they want is by going to conferences. And I put this under marketing simply because going to a conference is both educational, but it's also marketing. It's educational because there's there's people that get up and speak and and just talk to you about what they're looking for in both manuscripts and art, but they also critique your portfolio. And I'm talking about going to an SCBWI conference um, or like an, another, there's a lot of different other kinds of children's book um, conferences like writing for young readers that we have out here in Utah. Um, I know that Highlights does some in Pennsylvania, um, but there's a lot of different ones around the country. But SCBWI is the biggest. It's a worldwide organization, a nonprofit, and that stands for Society of Book Writers and Illustrators. Um, I highly recommend joining that. A lot of people, there, there are some complaints from joining that, like, oh, it didn't work, or you know, I, I'm hearing the same things over and over again, but at the same time, um, of all the people that I know that are published, most of them at one time or currently have been or are a member of, of SCBWI. The simple reason for that is you're, you're hanging out with your people. So if you're going to be a children's book illustrator and, and or author, you kind of need to, to f fly and, and hang out and, and rub elbows with the people that are also doing that and the amount of education you'll get from the people that are at those conferences is invaluable you'll pick up things that you don't realize you're learning just at lunch or when you're sitting next to somebody and seeing what they're doing you'll start to realize and and see the mistakes that you're ma making and, and things like that so it's educational but also you get to sign up for portfolio reviews in fact i'm going to be um it, um, speaking at an SUWI in Texas in September in Dallas, and I'll be reviewing portfolios. So um, people that are that have signed up for that conference, some of them have decided to sign up for my portfolio reviews, and I'll give them my best advice on what they need to work on um, to make their portfolios more marketable towards editors and um, and art directors. Okay. Um, so there's postcards there's also the social media people get jobs from social media and i i will just tell you um right now like and again we go over this in in the the class on on our site but um there's a nuance to how you contact art directors you you know you can't just reach out and grab an art director and just go look i want a job give me a job you know um man, don't you like my work? And, and you know, like, it's funny because I, I can tell sometimes when people have just decided like overnight, like, like it's like a lot of times I'll get questions on Mondays a lot. And I, I have a theory on this, why I get questions on Mondays. Cause on Sunday there's family get togethers and someone's asked Joe or Sally what they're doing with their life. And they're like, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm going to do, I'm really thinking about getting into children's book. Maybe they've just finished school or something 
and just verbalizing it at the family dinner or something has made made them decide I got to act on this because now people are going to start questioning me and it just kind of jogs there. Anyway, that's just a theory I have, but it seems like I get a lot of questions on Mondays. Um, and it's, it's also interesting that a lot of times people, I can tell they just barely decided that, you know, they want to make this thing happen um, because they're, they're really aggressive on how they're asking for help. And that's kind of a turnoff to especially to like an art director or an editor you have to remember their life has they have been doing this for years some of them decades they're excited about what they do but they're not excited about what you do yet and so if you come at them i'm going to be the next big thing and you need to pay attention to me it's just they're going to try to keep you at bay this is going to take time and this is going to take um consistency and the way to use social media is to make great art and post it and make more great art and post it. And yes, you can tweet to editors. You can tweet to art, art directors every now and then, maybe once a month. But uh, it is, I would say it is breaching social media protocol to tag them in something on Facebook, which which basically means you're putting your art, you, you, you basically just graffitied their, their Facebook wall. I wouldn't do that. That's a no-no. Um, you know, you you've got to the 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 more you do great art, the more these art directors and editors will start to see you. They're all on social media and they're all looking for great art. And the more you do great art, you know, there there a lot of people will ask me, well, "What's the secret? How do I get people to share my stuff? I don't know enough people. I I can't get people to share my stuff." You've got to think of the the viral videos and and memes and things that get shared around on on the internet um, most of the time you don't know who the author is or the the artist um, or the composer or the creator or whatever um, there's a project that you share because it touches you in the heart in some way it's either it touches you emotionally and you're like I want to be the first one to share this with my friends you don't give a rats about the person who created it you want to be the hero that gets to present this to your friends, right? And to, to share it with them. That's how you get work from social media is you do something so amazing that when people look at it, they either want to cry or they want to bust out laughing or they want to get angry or something. They have some, they're talking back to the screen. They're like, oh my gosh, look at that. Um, and if you're not getting shared around, it means you're not creating that. It's just plain and simple. It means you're doing something that is safe and predictable and predict and boring and you know and and that's the harsh reality. Um, and and a project that comes to mind right now uh, that I was talking about and looking at before. One of my hero illustrators is Chris Sheban, um, and I mean I just love his work. I'll link him too. Um, but he's he is in the process. I think he's finished with it, where he he illustrated a children's book um, about a ki kids using a box, like a cardboard box, and it, you should just Google it. Just Google Chris Sheban and cardboard box, or box, excuse me. And the work is amazing. It's so fresh, it's so original. I don't want to try to describe it here, but if you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. His stuff gets shared. Um, he's become a big name because he's got a great um, art style. He's got great skills, but he's also smart and creative and thinking outside the box. No pun intended. But it's like you know, you know, uh, the idea that he came up with is just fresh. And when you come up with something like that, people are going to share it. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll also talk about um, this, which is kind of a little self-serving. Um, idea and that is that you know I've been those of you guys who've been following me for a while know that I've been working on this um, fan art book um, and all the the prints that I've been doing for um, for for um, conventions and for my Kickstarter and everything um, and you know I'll link the Kickstarter too <laughs> this is going to be this is going to be the uh, the video of links but um 
I um, and I mentioned this in another video, but you know, I I did this. I changed my style up a little bit simply because I felt like it would help me get more attention at, at conventions. I really second guessed that project. Um, you know, I I turned down some children's book work to do it. It was something that I was really interested in doing. It was something that was really fun for me, and I think that was the the main the most important thing. Um, and I am actually jumping into number three right now with projects. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you that. Number three is projects because let me just back up a second. Number one, you know, you're, you're creating, you're you're developing your art. Number two, you're marketing it. Then, as you're marketing it, what are you going to do? Twiddle your fingers, waiting for the for the email to come in, going, "Hey, we've got a book project for you." In the meantime, work on projects. So, um, you know, I and the other thing is I'm in a little bit different situation because I have a lot of different um, opportunities that I'm working on. So I'm I where I used to be, um, you know, like uh, seven or eight years ago, I used to do nothing but freelance illustration, and then I really got heavily into teaching. So I was doing freelance and teaching. And then I started doing this, this, these YouTube videos and that did a lot. And then I started to do some of my own projects like the, the children's story apps. If you go way back in on my YouTube videos, I've got videos on those. Um, also the eBooks that I was doing. Um, and then of course the, the different tutorials and things like that. But so my, my income comes from a lot of different directions, <clears throat> but, um, but so that you're not waiting uh, for, for something you need to be involved in doing something. And, and this is the plug for doing projects. So, you know, I'm turning down work. That's not interesting because I'm not doing it for the money. I don't want the money. I'd rather have my time than work on something that I don't want to work on. I'm, I just turned 50 this year. Yay. Um, and I don't feel like I have a whole lot of time left really. I mean, like the first 50 years went by pretty fast. Um, I don't think I have another 50. So, I really want to spend my time doing things that I love. And I feel like one of life's um, uh, skill sets is actually avoiding things that really don't, doesn't make you happy or doesn't, doesn't further promote your, your career. And so um, it's been very important for me to turn down projects that they might pay well, but they're not interesting. Or I feel like this, the story isn't good, or I feel like, the subject matter isn't going to be fun or challenging to, to work on, or the art direction is going to be heavily handed. And uh, if you haven't done a project like that, just wait till you do and you'll understand. I would rather be outside digging a ditch for somebody, a mindless job, than working on artwork that I hate. And those of you who have done it know exactly what I'm talking about. It is putting emotional labor into something that you hate is much harder than putting physical labor into something that you hate. I don't like digging ditches, especially on a hot day, but I really would rather do that than work on artwork that I hate. Um, so back to the project. So anyway, long story short, start working on the Kickstarter, and uh, and then I get the I get an email one day, um, and this was only a few months ago, a month and a half ago, something like that, uh, maybe only a month ago, and. Um, it's an art director uh, or a creative director from Random House who said, "Hey, you know, I've been following your your work and on this this project, and I, we think it would be perfect for a book. Do, would, you, would you be willing to look at the manuscript?" And anyway, long story short, I'm signing the contract on that. I've already started working on it. I really wish I could share with you um, the initial illustrations or as we go along, but unfortunately. And I'm going to ask if I can share some of it. So I don't know yet, but um, if I can, I can. If I can't, I can't. But uh, we'll and we'll see it anyway. It's it's going to be published and due out um, in the fall of 2017. So eventually, it'll, it's going to come out anyway. But um, but that's where doing a project, you know, can lead to other bigger things because because I was having so much fun with it, because it was something that I was putting all my effort into. I mean, like working, and I mentioned this before, there's no way I could justify the amount of time I, I was doing on it. My wife was second guess. She's like, how much time are you spending on this? Because really, if you look at it, the time that I'm spending on 
the, the book that I'm doing for the Kickstarter is called Little. And the time that I spend on that is at least 10 hours per illustration times 100 illustrations. It's 1,000 hours. It's more, and that doesn't count um, all the time that I'm like working on um, tweaking things for the book and, and manip- ma- um, um, massaging the, the art to fit the format a little bit better and making alterations and different things like that. Um, probably another 100 hours on top of that. Um, working with the art director, or the I'm sorry, the um, the graphic designer Marilee Olson, who is designing the book right now as we speak, um, and uh, working with the printer, and just just all kinds of stuff that's gone into it. And there's no way I could justify it except that there's every reason I can justify it because it's something that I love to do, and my passion is going to show in that project. And because of that. I had the faith to know that it would go, it would take me into an area that would go beyond um, what I've already been doing in the past, just kind of banging out the same thing um, and working on the same kinds of projects. And, you know, once you kind of start getting a, a portfolio developed, you'll end up attracting the same types of projects. And that's kind of what I was finding is like, I'm getting known as the guy that does X, you know, and all this colorful artwork and and but I'm not getting other types of of children's books that I that I wanted to get and so I thought you know what this is going to be way different a lot of people questioned it a lot of people said you know well how come you're not doing your color aren't you aren't you going away from what you do and that really got me thinking and I really second guessed it because of that Um, but this really kind of proves to me that I was heading down the right path because now I'm working on this book that is truly a dream job it i can say it's a halloween book um and it is it's fantastic the idea is great i love this the story um i love the characters and i i've been like i said i've been working on it i couldn't wait to get started on it um and it's i think it'll just be a a super project to, to be working on and i wouldn't have got it if i hadn't started doing my own project so there you go so there's there's uh an anecdotal evidence of why you should be doing projects another one another person that i'm going to link in here and tell you to look up is sarah jane Wright, and um she's another person and i think i've talked about her before on the vlog but she um is is um an artist who was doing um really creative stuff i think what i'll do i'll I'll just link her site but um just know this that she was doing artwork for etsy and just doing like little prints and things like that with with that really appealed to um a certain demographic of of women um to decorate their their houses with and it was it was really uh, i i would I, i wouldn't say it's like mary inglebright but kind of in that genre maybe I think um, I'm not that's not my my thing really but it but it really appealed to a certain group and she was killing it and is killing it on on Etsy um, making thousands of dollars a month in her Etsy shop and from that project lo and behold one day she got a call from uh, an editor saying hey would you I, I follow your Etsy shop I don't know I can't remember if she bought some of her prints and stuff like that but she found her on Etsy of all places and said, would you ever be um, interested in doing a children's book? And she ended up getting to do a bunch of children's books and still doing that now. And she's just, she started writing and I, I've, yeah, I can't, I can't talk about it, but I know she signed a really big deal um, with a big publisher on a series of books. And, um, and it's all, all from the initial, just getting out there and doing it. I think, the, the, the takeaway for me that I hope you're getting out of this is it's not enough to create a portfolio. It's not enough to create a portfolio and then start to market that portfolio. We It used to be, um, but now we live in a time where, um, you know, where art directors were, were getting hit from this direction and now they're getting, with the internet, they're getting hit from, from all sides. Behind, you know, there's they're being bombarded with, with images from... Pinterest and Etsy and in um, Instagram and they're seeing 
uh, things on on Kickstarter. Um, they're they're seeing things on Facebook, on Twitter, just everywhere. People doing these amazing projects. And the one thing about um, the one thing about editors and and art directors that I can tell you is they are always looking for something new. So the, what they're what they're basically doing. The, the way I look at it, and, and they might say it a little bit differently, but the way I look at it is they're looking for either the veterans who are proven, uh, veteran illustrators and authors who are proven to make a lot of money for them. So um, the books that have done really well, to me, now this is, an, this is a guy who, you know, I don't work on the inside of the publishing company, but in talking to different editors and different art directors, I ask them questions, I ask them these types of questions. So I'm getting answers from some of them, not, I'm definitely not in a room with 500 art directors and editors going, hey, what do you guys think about this? But what I'm hearing is that basically, if a book sells really well, and I would love for an art director to come on and comment on some of these videos, that would be totally awesome if if they had different information or something. but. Um, for what I get is that if a book sells really well, then sometimes the sales department um, and the editors, uh, you know, they don't question whether or not to work with that author or that illustrator again. They basically just say, this is a combination, this is a, a concoction, a recipe that worked, so let's do it again. Because the bottom line is they have to make money or they go out of business. Um, and they have to show their shareholders uh, increases in profits, right? Uh, they always have to be fighting for that for that dollar. So, if so, in other words, they're going to continue working with people that have worked. The downside is if you work with them and your books don't sell, that's a real ding uh, on you, and that will stay with you. So, when they decide to work with with someone, they will look up their sales figures. Um, and if their sales figures are really crappy, there's a good chance that even though they like the artist, they might not work with that artist simply because they get shot down by the sales force. Um, or they go into their acquisitions meeting and they just say, you know, well, the numbers don't add up. We can't, we can't justify this. So they have criteria they have to look at. So they're looking at those people. They're also looking at new people. New people don't have a track record. So it's e in some ways, it's easier to sell in the acquisitions meeting because they can say this person's art style looks like so-and-so's who did really well right and i wonder if that happened with my book the one that i just am starting to work on like did they say well will's uh pencil pencil style looks sort of like so-and-so's which did really well i don't know um and maybe it's just like we want to take a shot on this, we really feel good about it, and these are the reasons why, and maybe they can't justify it sales-wise, I don't know. But they're always looking for new people, so that's a good sign for you, that's a good sign for anybody who's up and coming, um, or if you come up with a different style, you know, a different look, like I kind of did with this Kickstarter book, Little, and then all of a sudden, now I'm working on a book. Okay, so, that's number three, projects. Projects, not portfolios. You've got to work on projects. I mean, get your portfolio good. But we don't live in a day where you can just go in. And it used to be where you could go in and show your portfolio. You can't do that anymore. Um, when, when Again, I I've, I've, know I've talked about this before real quick. After 2008, they laid off a ton of art directors and editors. They didn't hire, from what I hear, they haven't hired them all back. So their sales, their their um, production staff, is still a fraction of what it used to be. And art directors, they literally have no time. Editors, it's it's amazing. Like I, I don't know how. Like my day is leisurely compared to theirs. Like I don't schedule out every minute. They do, and sometimes they can't take lunch because they're they're just too busy. They've got so many meetings and so many things that they have to get done, and they absolutely don't have time for you to come in and for them to look over your portfolio that's a thing of the past primarily i don't hear of it really happening anymore where you can get FaceTime with an art director and editor so your por portfolio um, really needs to be on a website online um, and 
it needs to be accessible because when you send the postcard, I'm kind of backtracking here a little bit, but when you send that postcard, they need to see your web address and they need to be able to go and see more work. If they can't see more work that backs up that postcard. In other words, if the postcard's the best thing you've done and your portfolio is a letdown, forget about it. You're not going to get any work, but don't let that discourage you. Um, and the other thing is they need to see postcards, unfortunately, for you and for your wallet. They need to see them coming in regularly. And I would suggest every other month to basically establish, like if they see something they, they like, one of the things that can happen is, you know, they they love what you're doing, but they don't have a project for you at that time. So out of sight, out of mind, they loved it for a few minutes. They even thought about you the next day and then it's gone. But every other month or so, you're, you're reminding them, hey, I'm still here and I'm still doing this awesome work. And then pretty soon they start collecting those postcards and then they're like looking for a project to use you on. And then it might be a year later. It might be six months later. It might be a year. It might be three years. But sometimes that's what will happen. You'll get a, an email saying, I've been getting your postcards. And you're, you're thinking that they're, they're seeds that are going out there and just falling on rocky ground when really some of them have actually started to sprout, you know. And so there's that. Okay, and then number four, and this is so important, but I don't have, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Number four is you need to be writing. Now, a lot of people that are trying to be, trying to figure out how to be a children's book illustrator and, and doing the art, you know, trying to get your, your artwork up to this high level, the last thing you want to hear is, oh yeah, now you have to develop a whole nother skill set on top of that. You know, it's why, one reason why I don't spend a lot of time talking about that with my students at UVU because it's like they're just there trying to figure out how to make good illustrations. And if I bombard them with, hey, this is like what you're working on is great, but you're not even close. And when, by the time you graduate, you're still not going to be close because then you got to learn how to write. Um, and, you know, and I, I don't, I have not had, I almost had a book sold to Scholastic one time. It was a really sad story because it was like all but sold and then they backed out of it. And so it was so disappointing. Um, and I've put writing off for a while simply because I have so many other things going on. But it is something that it's one of my bucket list things is to actually write the story um, and illustrate the story. Or write and have somebody else illustrate it. But I want to be the, the author. Um, and, you know, but I've been doing this for long enough that I've established myself and and I've, I get books to illustrate but another way in you don't have to do this but another way to increase your odds of getting in the door as an illustrator is to do both is to create a project of a book that um that um authors and or editors and art directors can't resist and like oh we have to publish this book we have to we have to figure out a way to get this on our schedule um it's very hard and it will take a long time to develop that skill. But there are a lot of illustrators that I know today who are illustrators simply because they authored their books and they got in that way. Um, and it's an author's world. So, uh, you know, I like to say that we are, illustrators are basically the cab drivers for authors because we are. And then in contracts, it shows if a book gets made into a movie the illustrator typically gets nothing and um, the author will get everything. Uh, um, the, if there's a if there's a movie deal, the illustrator usually doesn't get anything. Um, which happens with children's books all the time. You've got Jumanji um, and Polar Express and different, different books like that. Um, um, and a bunch of others that I'm not even thinking about, but, um, but it does happen. And um, so, the other thing is the authors get to make decisions on the art a lot of times and you're thinking why do they get to do that i'd like to make some decisions on on the the story but it doesn't really flow that way you know it's it's really it is an author's world and you just have to know that and so being part of that um and working your way into that is a good thing it's good for you you'll get double paid double if you do sell a book um, but it is another way in, and um, it's another way to get your work looked at um, if you have a picture book dummy. Sometimes at the conferences, 
there'll be portfolio reviews, but what the editors are really interested in are the book dummies because sometimes there's little diamonds in the rough that's a complete project. And the other thing is um, editors love working with a single person, author, illustrator. It's much easier for them. It's cheaper for them. And um, you as, and we talk about this in the class, but you as an author and illustrator can say things, can write your story differently than an author. An author has to write the story and use usually typically use more words to explain uh, what they're trying to say um, in the story. And they're, they're worried that if they leave stuff out for the, for the illustrations that the illustrator won't actually explain it. So they'll over explain things and editors know this and they know that there's an economy of words that takes place and a kind of a, I don't know, like, not 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 in, in in i mean i guess what i'm sa saying is there are exceptions to the rule there are many great books that are done by an author and a separate illustrator so i'm not trying to say that that will always create a better um project because it doesn't but it creates a different kind of project let's say it that way um some of the best books have been you know two people author and illustrator um but I think they create typically different books. And I think that's one thing that um, editors are excited about. And also I think a lot of the Caldecott winners have been to author illustrators. And, I, and I, so I think that there's actually a financial goal from the publishers that are actually looking for that one person that they can then push really hard to try to get them into that Caldecott range. So uh, for what it's worth, there's that. Um, Okay, so I think that's about it. I think that's the best information that I can give you on breaking into the children's book world. It's a long, warm road, I would say, because there's a lot of friendly people along the way. Um, but it's not an overnight thing for most people. But there are those stories where people go to these conferences and then they walk away with book deals from an editor seeing their book dummy or their portfolio and giving them a job right on the spot. So that's why you can't discount going to conferences. I can't stress that enough. Um, you've got to immerse yourself in the world of children's books and you can do it. Um, but it's going to take a lot of hard work and dedication. And you basically have to decide, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm here. I'm going to work super hard. I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to make it happen. And you can, you can do it. Lots of people have, um, and we were all told the same thing when we were in school. It's impossible. You'll never be able to break into the business. Um, I mean, we, we were told when you know 25 years ago when I was in school, um, maybe in the class of 20, they said maybe 1% to 5% of you will make it. That means one of you in here in this class will actually get to do this for a living, you know. Um, and we were all looking around like, uh, which one is it going to be, you know. Um, so, anyway... It's always been hard. It always will be hard, but it's worth it. It's if it's something that you love to do. I mean, I mean, I selfishly, I mean, I love getting up in the morning and knowing that I get to come in here and work on illustration instead of going to a real job. So I love it. And anyway, thanks for watching. Don't subscribe unless you want to see more stuff like this. And I'll see you on the next video. Oh,